everyone. My name is Patsy Iwasaki, and I want to thank you and welcome you to my presentation, Respect and Tolerance Among Diverse Communities Through a Graphic Novel in Hawaii. I really wish I could be there in person, and I was so looking forward to visiting your lovely and historic city. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted all of our lives. My deepest regards and sympathy goes out to all of you who are dealing with this crisis and who may have lost loved ones to, to the virus. I'm thankful for this opportunity to share my research and teaching practices with you, despite being thousands of miles away. So let me begin by saying aloha to all of you. Aloha is Hawaiian for hello, hi, it's a greeting, much like hola in Spanish. I want to thank the University Complutense Madrid, University of Burgos, One Asia Foundation, Professor Asun Lopez Varela, Vice Chancellor Domingo, and Professor Gianna Sotelo for kindly inviting me to take part in this course that seeks to bring diverse perspectives and increase global understanding. I am so committed and passionate about global education, cross-cultural and multicultural studies, and about building cross-cultural relationships. This COVID-19 pandemic affecting everyone around the world is truly showing us that we're more similar than different. Although we come from many different backgrounds, cities and countries, and speak many languages, we truly are one human race living on one single planet Earth. I strongly believe that building relationships, especially cross-cultural relationships, is a universal global truth. Here are the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's very tiny, so some world maps might not even have its location. Here I am on the island of Hawaii, in the city of Hilo, right by the Bay of Hilo. And here's a photo of me in front of the Hilo Bay. Let's begin. Hamakore Hiro, a true plantation story, is about Katsugoto, an immigrant from Japan who came to work in the sugarcane fields of Hawaii in February 1885. He was 24 years old. He was also a labor martyr who was lynched and killed in 1889 in Honoka'a on Hawaii Island for labor facilitation and advocacy on behalf of Japanese plantation workers. As you can see from this map here, because of its strategic location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, many countries who are interested in the Hawaiian Kingdom, such as Russia, England, but especially the United States, the United States wanted a strategic location for military base and for economic industry. And the United States did indeed succeed. A military base was established at Pearl Harbor on Oahu in 1887. This is Oahu right here, and Pearl Harbor is right here. It's a natural bay. And the overthrow of the monarchy, the overthrow of Hawaii's last queen, Queen Liliokalani, came in 1893. Annexation to the United States occurred in 1898. I want to share one interesting story between Hawaii and Japan. In 1881, King David Kalakaua traveled all around the world and stopped in Japan for two weeks. He tried to deflect American ambitions towards Hawaii and possibly place Hawaii under the empire of Japan's protection. So he proposed a marriage between his niece, Crown Princess Kailani, with Prince Higashi Fushimi Yorihito. While the proposal did fall through, it's interesting to think about the possibilities if Hawaii had come under Japanese rule. King Kalakaua's world tour also had an economic purpose. He was being pressured by sugar plantation owners to find additional labor sources for the lucrative sugar industry that was booming in Hawaii. The Reciprocity Treaty of 1875 was a free trade agreement between the United States and the Hawaiian Kingdom that guaranteed a tax-free market for Hawaiian sugar in exchange for economic privileges and the naval base at Pearl Harbor. The immigrant labor force from Asian countries such as China, Japan, and Korea during this time is what created the multicultural society of Hawaii that we have today. By 1924, over 200,000 Japanese nationals were living in Hawaii from many prefectures in Japan. And there were many women who labored in the fields as well, as you can tell from this photo. 
Immigrants also came from Portugal. Because of their European background, they were assigned to supervisory positions, and they were called Luna. What was happening in Japan at that time? After the Warring States period, Ieyasu Tokugawa successfully united the country and established the Tokugawa Shogunate, which lasted for 265 years. In order to exert control over the country, the Tokugawas established a policy called Sakoku, or seclusion. No one was allowed to leave the country and no foreigners were allowed into the country except for a few specific ports in Japan. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry, with orders from the United States to establish trade with Japan, arrived at Tokyo Bay with his black ship's cannons pointed at the city. Trade with China was very successful, and the United States wanted to enter the Japanese market. With weapons pointed at them, the Japanese had no choice but grudgingly agreed and signed the Kanagawa Treaty in 1854. The Japanese government then made the significant decision to embrace Western culture and ideology, and this was the beginning of the Meiji Restoration, named after Emperor Meiji Mutsuhito, who ruled from 1868 to 1912. He was just 15 years old when he came, became emperor, and his reign was called Enlightened Rule. The Japanese government wanted to take part on the world stage and close the gap in all areas, technology, government, transportation, education, business, and the military. Scholars were sent out to attend universities around the world and learn from different countries. And foreigners were hired and brought in with their expertise. They looked to England for guidelines in government and architecture, Germany for education, medicine and science, the United States for military expertise, and so forth. The Japanese went from a medieval society and agrarian rice culture to an industrial modern power in such a short time. The Japanese government and family industries like Mitsui and Mitsubishi financed all of these expenses. It was quite expensive to send out scholars and to bring in experts from around the world. They overextended themselves financially, which became a financial crisis for the entire country. And what does a government do when they're in trouble? They enact taxes. The government applied mandatory taxes to the people. At this time, there were also several years of poor rice harvests. The combination of the poor harvest and taxation caused 370,000 residents to lose their properties between 1883 and 1890. They sold their properties to pay for the taxes. Thus, for the Japanese government, the call from Hawaii for labor recruits for the sugar plantations was a form of economic relief. Plus, the laborers to Hawaii would need to send back to Japan 25% of their income from Hawaii, thus supporting Japan's economy. And for King David Kalakaua and the sugar plantation owners, the Japanese would be a much needed labor force for the labor-intensive sugar cane. For the Japanese, after being isolated for hundreds of years, many caught what was called a broad fever. It wasn't a physical illness, but a fever to see what's out there beyond the confines of Japan. Recruiters advertised fields of gold and get-rich-quick dreams. There were 26 shiploads of contract laborers under the government contract agreement with King Kalakaua and the Hawaiian Kingdom. The contract agreement was called Kanyaku Imin, or in English, first ship immigrants. The first ship was called City of Tokyo, and, non, and that's not a um, spelling error. And 944 nas Japanese nationals arrived in Honolulu Harbor on February 8, 1885. Katsugoto was aboard that ship. After this government contract labor agreement, private companies continued the immigration from Japan to Hawaii. Just who was Katsugoto, and why is my graphic novel about him? He was born to a farming family in Kanagawa Prefecture in Japan, about an hour away from present-day Tokyo. He was born Katsuzo Kobayakawa. He was also the Chonan, the oldest son in the family. And because of the strict guidelines during Meiji period Japan, as the oldest in the family, the eldest son, he was expected to inherit the family property and take care of his parents. It was even illegal and unlawful for him to leave the country. 
Thus, in order to leave Japan as a sugar plantation laborer, he had to remove himself from the official family registry and become adopted in name only by the Goto family, who was also living on the city of Tokyo. On, on that same um, on that same government contract agreement. It was interesting because the Gotos were a young couple and had a one year old daughter named Sayo and Katsugoto at this time was 23 years old. Here's a page from the graphic novel, a scene of Katsu and his mother, just highlighting the emotions that might have been um, surrounding that situation. I exercised artistic license and included this adaptation in the interest of storytelling. The preceding page is, the, is his mother dropping the news about an arranged marriage possibility to Katsu. So he's replying back to her, oh, mother, I need to tell you something. And she says, don't tell me you already have someone. And he breaks the news to her. The government is signing people up for the Kanyaku Imin. I'm going to Hawaii. And, and her reaction, you know, you can't leave. You're my firstborn son. You can't leave me. As in other cultures, arranged marriages were common in Japan, and that practice continued in Hawaii. Some of the laborers were married or had a family, such as the Goto family who adopted Katsu. But most of the laborers were single men, and after living in Hawaii, they wanted to marry Japanese women. The arranged marriages, arranged marriage practice came to be known as picture brides. Although picture brides flourished between 1908 and 1924, a little later than Katsugoto's time period, I wanted to pay tribute to all of the picture brides who came to Hawaii. Because of them, the Japanese immigrants were able to start families and create communities. Although the immigrants could never become U.S. citizens, their children, born after U.S. annexation in 1898, could become citizens and buy and own property. going back to that. This slide adds a little lighthearted humor to an otherwise serious, grim, and true situation that occurred between young girls and men in Hawaii, with only a photo, sometimes taken years before, to seal the marriage. Mass marriages were performed at the immigration facility when they were picked up by the men. Approximately 20,000 Japanese, Okinawan, and Korean women came to Hawaii as picture brides. This woman is, shows Goto a photo of the man she's just married. And his reply, his reply is, oh, he's a really a good man. Mm, yes, but so old, nothing like the picture he sent me. And then he's agreeing, maybe he is a little older than this photograph. And she's saying, but this looks like it was taken 20 years ago. At first glance, you can understand why so many Japanese would want to emigrate to Hawaii. The Japanese economy was in a recession, rice harvests were poor, and many residents thought they might do better in Hawaii. Most of the labor rec recruits were second or third sons. However, in my research about Katsugoto, I learned that he was not your typical recruit at all. He was the oldest son in his family, set to inherit the family name and property. But I also learned that he was educated and had quite a bit of English proficiency. He first worked at the village government office in his town, hometown of Kanagawa, but only a year after he was promoted to the prefectural office in Yokohama. And Yokohama was a thriving, growing city that was one of the main ports where foreigners could trade and live. He was also a writer and editor of the Yokohama Boy Kinipo, translated to the Yokohama Daily Trade Report that was published by the Yokohama Chamber of Commerce. He reported on information about foreign relations and commerce. He was an up-and-coming professional in one of the most thriving cities in Asia, in the world, and he gave it all up to go to Hawaii. He gave up his name, his family property, and his job and positions. To go to Hawaii and perform hard physical labor for low pay? Why? Why would he do that? I can only imagine that he had caught a bad case of a broad fever. He was working in the port of Yokohama, seeing scholars leave for exciting assignments all over the world, and seeing experts from around the world arrive to the port. Since he wasn't part of the elite group of scholars selected to go abroad, perhaps this was the only way he could see the world and relieve his abroad fever. So Katsugoto was 23 years old and assigned to Sopa Wright and Company Plantation on the Hamako coast of the Big Island on a three-year contract. 
and his contract featured nine, and this is where it is, the location of the Hamako coast. And remember, this was Hilo. His contract featured $9 a month for males, $6 a month for females. He was getting paid that much. 26 days of work a month, 10 hours per day. The monthly food allowance was $6 for males, $4 for females, and there was free lodging, medical care, and cooking fuel. Laborers could be placed in jail for refusing to work, and time taken off for illness would require additional work after their contract expired. The lodging was free, but some of the early sugar plantation lodging looked like this, and medical care was also very poor. Katsugoto endured three years of backbreaking labor for low pay that often consisted of cleaning land, digging ditches, planting, fertilizing, weeding, and harvesting the cane. Hole Hole Bushi, Songs of the Sugar Plantation. Hole Hole Bushi were simple, plaintive, poignant songs that the Japanese plantation laborers made up as they worked long hours in the cane fields under the hot tropical sun. Hole Hole means to strip the cane, a task usually assigned to women. And bushi is a Japanese term for the blues. Uh, so this is, is a well-known hole hole bushi um, sung by women. And it goes, my husband cuts the cane. I do the hole hole. By sweat and tears we get by. Wonderful Hawaii, or so I heard. One look and it seems like hell. The manager's the devil and his lunas are demons. When his contract ended after three years, Goto opened up a general store in Honoka'a in 1888, near the plantation where he worked. He became the first Japanese store owner, and he would finally be able to use the professional skills he gained while in Yokohama. Prices were competitive, and he stocked Japanese groceries and merchandise from Oahu that made the Japanese immigrants feel closer to their homeland. Goto's general store quickly prospered, and it soon became a gathering place for the fledgling Japanese community in Honoka'a. And Goto became a leader for his community. This photo was probably taken when he opened his general store. It is the only known photo of him. As the Japanese laborers began to see the severe injustices of the plantation system, they sought in small ways at first to seek improvements. Because he knew English, Goto became the liaison between the laborers and plantation management. He advocated for improved working conditions and wages. He facilitated mediation and served as the interpreter. When they ran into a problem, the workers would seek out Goto's help. In October 1889, several men refused to work. Whether it was because of illness or perhaps a strike, it didn't say. Two weeks later, on October 19, 1889, there was a fire in the cane fields. Although there was no evidence, these men who refused to work were blamed for the fire. An investigation followed, and a hearing took place involving the men who said they were sick and couldn't work two weeks earlier. District Judge Frederick and S. Lyman sentenced one suspect to jail for 30 days. Over and hired an attorney to sue the remaining suspects for breach of contract and abstaining from work. So, he, so they're saying, you are being fined $20 for breach of contract, and $20, we don't have that kind of money. We had nothing to do with the fire. We only make $9 a month and only get six seventy-five dollars because of the 25% wages automatically um, taken out and sent to Japan. Robert Overin was the owner of Okawa Plantation along the Hamako coast on the Big Island. And Overin believed Goto was a champion for labor rights and instigated unrest among his employees. So he forbade Katsugoto to set foot on his plantation. And Robert Overin believed that Goto was be behind the unrest and also the fire among his Japanese laborers. He had cursed Goto and had forbade him ask access to Konoka Plantation a year before when his three-year contract was fulfilled. Overin threatened Goto with his life if he ever came to his employees' quarters at Overin Camp. Thus, not only was Goto a target from Overin and the plantation, but Joseph Mills, the owner of the other store in Honoka'a who was threatened and jealous over Goto's store success. 
Mills was an influential and powerful man on the Big Island. He worked for the Kingdom of Hawaii, was the postmaster, notary public, and was a large landowner. On the night of October 28, Goto risked his life and rode over his horse over to house number four at Overend Plantation Camp. He listened to the men discuss their problem and he says, we have to stick together to come to a solution. I feel that my life is in danger by being here, but I'm not afraid. In the court records of the trial, witnesses say they heard dogs barking. The dogs were barking because people were watching the meeting at the house and waiting for Goto to leave the meeting so they could ambush him. When Goto left the camp after 10 p.m. at night, he was lynched from his horse and his head was injured. Then he was hung on a telephone pole in Honoka'a town. He was found hanging on the morning of October 29, 1889. His white horse that he had just purchased recently was near the pole. Lynchings were common toward Black Americans in the South at this time, but, um, but not in, in Hawaii. Dr. Gary Okihiro, an American history scholar and author of many books said, a lynching is not a murder, not an execution. It is an act of terror. Lynching is an act of terror. It's not just for the victim. It is not to seek justice against a perpetrator. It is to teach the living a lesson. And that's why bodies were left. That's why lynchings were spectacles. People, men, women, and children had picnics around the lynching in the South. They would gather for that, and it was a lesson for those who ruled that they were in control, and it was a lesson for those who were subjects, subjected to rule, that they should not cross that line or aspire to be equal to those who rule. That's a very harsh lesson, and that is terrorism. You inspire fear on the part of those dominated, and to be quiet, to listen, to agree with the rulers. Katsugoto's lynching was that message. He advocated on behalf of Japanese on the basis of law, and that threatened them. It also was an excellent example to the workers of what happens while you try, when you try to aspire for upward mobility. If you stay in your place, you're okay. But if you challenge us or try to become like us, you're going to get killed. An investigation of the murder was conducted and a trial began on May 6, 1890. It was a sensational case as Joseph Mills, the store owner, held many important positions in town. The trial ended on May 13. Four men were arrested and convicted of varying degrees of manslaughter and sent to jail on Oahu. Joseph Mills, the store owner, and three others who worked for Robert Overend, Thomas Steele, William Watson, and William Blabin. Mills and Steele received nine years, Blabon, Blabin five years, and Watson four years. They did not have enough evidence to convict Robert Overend himself. Many felt the sentences were unjustifiably unjust light, and in the end, Watson would be the only one to fulfill his sentence. Steele escaped through a window of the jail and left Oahu on a ship bound for Australia. Blabin slipped out of the prison gate and boarded a ship to San Francisco, and Mills was granted a full pardon and restoration of his civil rights by the Republic of Hawaii. But the story continued and still continues positively on with Dr. Fumiko Kaya, Katsugoto's adopted niece. Sekijiro Kobayakawa, Goto's younger brother, moved to Honoka'a after Goto's death. He and his wife adopted Fumiko in Honoka'a when she was an infant because her parents had died. And I just wanted to point out, this is Sekijiro Kobayakawa, Katsugoto's younger brother, his wife, and, uh, and Fumiko, who they adopted in Honoka'a. They left, Hawaii. they left Hawaii when she was five years old and returned to Japan. They realized that she would not have the opportunities in education or a profession if she remained in Hawaii at that time period. He believed that a woman has power when she can make her own way. And um, she, she, in an interview with her, uh, she told me that, that she really respected him and that he said that to her. 
She attended college and became a physician for the Hiroshima Prefecture. She also survived the atomic bombing on August 6, 1945. She knew that she was born in Hawaii, but her father, Sekijiro, had never shared about the tragic lynching of her uncle, Katsugoto. She find, found out about her own family history in 1985 while watching a documentary film about the 100th anniversary of Japanese immigration to Hawaii. There was a segment about her adopted uncle, Katsugoto, and her father, Sekijiro. She then conducted her own research and learned about Kagoto's labor advocacy for Japanese workers. And rather than becoming bitter and angry, she instead wanted to create an, an educational program in his name. She felt that communication and understanding were key issues, and she wanted to enhance, promote a bridge of friendship between Hawaii and Japan. She partnered with the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, and I was the first recipient of a grant back in 1993 as a college student. And uh, here I am, right here, and, uh, and this is Dr. Kaya. And um, seated around her are all the volunteers and board members of the foundation. Dr. Fumiko Kaya passed away at 94 years old in 2004. The foundation continued the program for a few more years, but closed the Hiroshima portion in 2007. The University of Hawaii at Manoa American Studies Program now administers the scholarships. Since I received the scholarship in 1993, I have felt compelled, really driven, to share this little known piece of history of Hawaii in as many ways as I can. I wrote many articles, and I wanted to share Katsugoto's story with more people. At first, I thought of a textbook or perhaps a watercolor print book, but at the time, my children were young, and they enjoyed graphic novels, also called manga. They would never read books for school, but they would devour graphic novels in minutes, and the genre, and the genre itself often covers serious topics. So my children were the inspiration for this graphic novel, and I partnered with a University of Hawaii Hilo art student, Avery Burrito, to uh, illustrate the, the book. During the last several years, I have incorporated the graphic novel into my classes as a learning module and assignment, seeking to answer the question, what can we learn from this graphic novel? As you have learned, Hawaii was not the racial paradise in the past, and it still isn't. We should not sugarcoat the past and ignore it. Rather, the answer is to embrace the past, understand it, and use its context to look into the future. So my answer is achieving tolerance and respect while living in a diverse multicultural society. And this can be applied to not only Hawaii, but the world. I would like to briefly share a handful of sources that provides a framework and foundation for my research and teaching practices. First is the culturally relevant pedagogy framework introduced by Gloria Ladson Billings back in 1995 and adapted and extended by many researchers, including Sherry, Shelley Brown Jeffy and Jewel Cooper in 2011. The UH Hilo mission and vision seeks to cultivate and sustain teaching practices that reflect a diverse multicultural university that is rooted in the rich mix of Native Hawaiian, Asian Pacific, local, national, and international cultures that represent Hawaii. And faculty are encouraged to add Hawaii-based resources to their curriculum. Maul, Amanti, Neff, and Gonzalez back in 1992 discussed how storytelling can encourage students to voice their own historic and cultural knowledge and to become experts of their own experiences and personal knowledge. Paris and Alim in 2014 discussed culturally sustaining pedagogy as the foundation for tolerance and respect by incorporating identity and cultural practice, which can also address systemic inequalities. San Pedro and Kinlock in 2014 and 2017 argue that exchanging stories is central to educational research and that stories can establish more inclusive, interconnected, and decolonizing methodologies that disrupt systemic inequalities in Western constructs. And Campano and Storniolo, Storniolo and Thomas, and Thomas and Storniolo, all in 2018, discussed collective knowledge, storytelling, and restoring as 
engagement and political actions, and that sharing stories through social movements like Black Lives Matter, Women's March, the Me Too movement, immigration rights, all address longstanding systemic violence and oppression and help students become agents of change. One major assignment for some of my classes is a research paper about current relevant topics such as immigration, diversity, culture, and social justice. The assignment encourages students to explore place-based, culturally relevant resources. And one of the resources students can use is Hamakur Hero. The assignment is very well received and the graphic novel serves as a starting point for students to conduct research in a number of areas. For example, Majorette Umayas is a first-generation Filipino-American student. She used the graphic novel as a launching point to learn about her own Filipino immigrant history. She researched Pablo Manla Pitt, a Filipino lawyer and labor organizer in Hawaii. Declan Cleary. His grandfather is originally from Hilo but moved to the U.S. mainland and Declan decided to, to come to school in Hawaii, to come to college in Hawaii, to, to be nearer, you know, the land of his roots, the land of his grandfather. Uh, and he is born and raised in the state of Arizona. Uh, he, he, found, he, was, he used the graphic novel as a learning and launching point about his own roots in Hawaii and the Hawaiian culture and he researched immigration history, law, and current views. He focused his paper on the immigration challenges of South and Central Americans in his home state of Arizona. And here is Joshua Wilson. His family moved to Pepekea on Hawaii Island along the Hamako coast where Katsugoto lived and worked. He researched the history of sugar in his hometown of Pepekea, and he interviewed residents in his neighborhood and co collected several oral histories. And he now understands the complicated issues of race and equity that is part of the history of Hawaii and a part of his neighborhood. Abiba Holt, her birth family is from Ethiopia, and she used the Hamakur Hero graphic novel as a launching point to research Black American history. She is very involved in diversity and equity issues on campus. She was part of a group of students who challenged a poster celebrating UH Hilo's ranking as the number one diverse school in the country. The group felt it wasn't diverse and reflective of the student body on campus. And so the group uh, reached out to the chancellor and it resulted in that the photo was retaken with the group's recommendations and guidance. These were just a few examples of how Hamako Hero is being used to create awareness and understanding of the past as a bridge to the future, creating respect and tolerance among diverse communities in Hawaii. And this can be applied to all communities. Which brings me to the end of my presentation. Mahalo nui loa, which means thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I hope that we may have the chance to meet again as we celebrate global cross-cultural relationships. Thank you. Mahalo nui loa. <laughs>